Our elected representatives have the power to legislate great change. What should be at the top of the to-do list for Hawaii's legislators this session? From our high cost of living, to affordable housing, to climate change, the breadth of issues could make this one of the most pivotal years for lawmakers, or it could be politics as usual. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff with Hawaii News Now. The second half of the 29th legislature convened yesterday in the shadow of an incident that exposed to the world unimaginable defects and flaws in Hawaii's state civil defense system. Accountability for human error and failure in process and performance will undoubtedly be scrutinized during this session, starting tomorrow, as a matter of fact. We'll discuss Saturday's false missile alert later in the show. There are other serious challenges facing lawmakers. Hawaii has one of the highest poverty rates in the country and 48% of all households can barely afford basic living expenses. Another study focused on how rising sea levels will drastically transform our island state and infrastructure during the next 40 years and why we need to act now to save the loss of property. Tonight, we hear not from legislators, but from you and some people who will be advocating on the behalf of Hawaii residents during this 2018 legislative session. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Colin Moore is an associate professor of political science and director of the Public Policy Center at the University of Hawaii. Nicole Wu is Senior Policy Analyst with the Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. Marty Townsend is the Chapter Director for the Sierra Club of Hawaii, one of the oldest grassroots environmental organizations in the islands. And Robert Nakata is Co-Chair with the Faith Action for Community Equities Affordable Housing Task Force and the Housing Now Hawaii Coalition. I was going to say How Hawaii Housing Now Coalition. Sorry about that. Well, let's start off. You know, there are a couple of 900-pound gorillas in the room as this legislature convenes. Uh, Colin Moore, uh, how do you think that this false bomb attack will land like a bomb at the state legislature? What kind of effect would it have? Well, first, it, it dramatically weakens Governor Ige. He wasn't in a particularly strong position to begin with, and now, I'm, I mean, this has definitely affected his approval ratings. He was already in a tough re-election fight with Colleen Hanabusa. Um, and so whatever... Um, ability he had to really push legislators to adopt his agenda, I think he's lost because legislators really respond if they think by supporting the governor that'll help them or they're afraid to oppose him. Now it's not so hard to oppose Governor Ige and I think this, you know, the best example I can give of their resistance to the governor is the fact that some of the most powerful people in the legislature, um, Senate President Ron Kochi, um, House Finance Chair Sylvia Luke, um, and Scott Psyche, the new Speaker of the House, were at Colleen Hanabusa's announcement for her own gubernatorial candidacy. And uh, Bob Nakata, as a former legislator yourself, former state representative, former state senator, what happens to the legislature when there's a big issue that people have a hard time avoiding? We, we've had experience with the same-sex marriage issue and so on. Why is it that one big issue can really derail a whole legislature? Fundamentally, the legislators are not the bravest people around. <laughs> I, to put it bluntly, I, I think the voters don't understand that frequently the legislators are afraid of them. If you get one call from an upset constituent, that's a big thing. If he or she comes down to see you, well, that's more dramatic. So the effect is the legislators will feel pressure to do something about the shiny object in the room and might get distracted from real work they need to do. Yeah. Um, Marty Townsend, you've had to push at Sierra Club a lot of environmental issues which tend to cost money and disrupt people's way of doing business sometimes. What's your fear about what might happen with that issue in the election year in a year where you're actually hoping to make some real progress? Um. I think the governor has an opportunity here to uh, 
demonstrate his leadership. Um, I think you know he views himself as a strong leader um, that's always kind of uh, outperformed expectations, and so I think this situation provides him an opportunity to do that. Um, and I think the legislators will follow whatever the wins are, right? The political wins, and political wins really are determined by the public. So, like Reverend Nakata said, if people come out and are talking about whatever is important to them, that's what legislators will focus on. And so, if people are talking about the false alarm, that's what they're going to focus on. Uh, but if people are talking about affordable housing, poverty, clean water, those are the things that the legislators will focus on. And Nicole Wu from Appleseed Center, you're you. Your agenda includes um, changes in the tax code, which a lot of people say never happened in election year anyway. What are your concerns about having this huge distraction, particularly at the beginning of the session when people are just starting to build an agenda? I think the uh, scare that we had on Saturday is something that we can't not talk about because we were all affected. You know, we all felt the stress, and we definitely need to figure out how to avoid more of those types of false alarms. But we have another crisis the housing crisis, the homelessness crisis. We see it in the streets every day. So I do think constituents will, you know, refocus. You know, maybe it'll take a couple weeks, but they'll refocus and they're concerned about our coastlines and our environment as well as the housing and homelessness situation. Uh, Colin Moore, uh, you know, you've seen legislatures deal with big issues. What is it the problem? I, one of the things I've observed over the years is the actual decision-making power is reserved to just a handful of people. That's right. I mean, here in Hawaii, the committee chairs, particularly the finance committee chairs or the money committee chairs, have tremendous power. I mean, there's another 3,000 bills that were from last session that they're going to consider again. And so if it doesn't, usually if it doesn't go through a finance committee or a judiciary committee, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, you know, there's some advantages to that. I mean, some people think a strong committee system does deliver better legislation. You have thoughtful people who understand um, the state's financial obligations looking at every bill. I mean, they're, they're picked by their peers, and we saw what can happen uh, with Jill Takuda last session um, when they, you know, are no, no longer supported by the members of their of their institution. And so I think, well, one thing I'd say is we have this system because people in the legislature want it. They could change the rules anytime they want. They could weaken the committees. And the other thing I'll say is, you know, one thing to watch this session is how Scott Psyche um, approaches this. I mean, we have a, a new House Speaker. Um, he's relatively young. Um, I mean, in the past, we have Joe Suki, Calvin Say, I mean, the real old guard. Um, I think Sky Psyche has been thought of earlier as a reformer among the younger legislators, and I think there's some question about how, how he's going to operate. Is he going to, you know, rule with more of an iron fist, threaten legislators, you know, that they won't get benefits for their district, or is he going to kind of, you know, take a, you know, let a, let a, you know, 100 flowers bloom approach? I mean, move more legislation out to committees? I, I think that's unlikely. I think I um, was hearing some harp music. Playing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think this is really going to be crucial. I mean, I, th I don't think, um, you know, voters don't like to hear about this procedural stuff. And the, the legislature loves to play this Game of Thrones stuff, which I think really infuriates a lot of voters. But these, these institutional rules end up having tremendous importance in the kind of legislation we see get passed. Bob, given your experience, do you see uh, anything really fundamentally changing about the way younger legislators approach things and older legislators? Yeah. The uh, younger ones this time around, I feel, are somewhat more deferential to the old guard. More deferential? Yeah. And uh, on the specific in issue that I'm concerned with, housing, something's happened which is relatively new. You guys in the media have had a tremendous impact on the agenda. I, mean, I, I never heard people talk about housing and homeless as a top priority before. You know, the, one of the things that um, going into this session that's been perplexing for a lot of people is the economy's pumping right now. Um, the tax projections are going up. Um, there's, a, 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 I think it was $800 million carryover out of the last fiscal year. And for the folks who have environmental agendas or tax agendas, uh, tax equity agendas, you'd think you'd be licking at your chops. But at the same time, the message that's coming out is not very promising, right, uh, Marty Townsend? Uh, I think the, 
economy is not as actually healthy and robust as we would like it to be, although the numbers are pumping. Um, uh, people are not faring very well. You know, it's hard to get a job that pays enough. Um, and we have a lot of long-standing systemic problems with the way in which we have developed our islands. Um, the bill is now coming due. So things like cesspools and failure to invest in sewers is just one example of how um, we now have these uh, compounding crises. What kind of message are you getting, Nicole Wu, about uh, tax equity issues from lawmakers when you ask them, you know, can you take a look at this this year? And they say, it's an election year. Uh, there's some interest. I think after the uh, federal, the Trump tax mm. cuts, there is an interest in seeing how our state can and maybe will have to respond to it. So we're giving them some ideas to sort of balance out uh, what has been done at the federal level. It's taking some time to go through that federal bill, though. It's very complicated. But as we all know, in general, the federal bill is giving huge tax cuts to people at the top and corporations. So there might be ways for the state to balance that out and maybe get some new revenues to fund some of our really important needed priorities here. Um, let, let me talk. start with you and uh, with Bob on the issues of economic equity and housing. I mean, what are some of the things that you think that people should see? I know that you did bring along uh, a graphic that sort of describes the, the lag between incomes and housing costs. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. uh, this slide um, shows how the minimum wage in Hawaii actually has been uh, slowly rising, but not nearly as much as the cost of housing. And in the graph, it just shows the minimum wage since 1990, when you adjust for inflation, has gone up by 23 percent. But if you look at the fair market rent for a two-bedroom, that's gone up by 52 percent. And if you use you know, median wages, average wages, they're pretty much flatlined at the bottom as well. And so we've had this huge jump in housing costs since early to mid 2000s, the last 15 years, I'd say. Um, not sure what's causing that, but it's definitely causing a squeeze on all of our families. Do you see much stomach, uh, Colin Moore, for um, in an election year messing with some of those really big issues like a, like a minimum wage or tax reform? I don't. Um, I mean, you know, that's kind of standard wisdom about what happens in an election year, and I, I wish I could say we're in for a really exciting session, but that's that's simply not true. Um, I mean, there might be there might be small gains. I mean, there are some legislators like um, um, like Jill Takuto who are running for lieutenant governor who might want to deliver kind but of. But right at the end of at the end of yeah. last year, she, she lost her position. Well, yeah, right? exactly, so, exactly. So less power. Um, I mean, there, there might be uh, some interest in delivering, um, you know, s small benefits. Um, you know, so Kapuna Care, has, which was passed last session, has gotten a lot of positive press. It's very popular. I think funding that, um, you know, there's some bills out about um, um, family leave insurance that is, you know, kind of similar to the, the sort of bill that was passed with Kapuna Care. I mean, it, it serves a similar population. Um, you might see some movement on that. I mean, but obviously the biggest issues are these affordability issues. And that is a, it is a tough thing to solve. I mean, this is one of these wicked hard problems that will take a lot of money. And I just don't see that kind of investment coming from, from this legislature this year. Um, you know, Marty mentioned, uh, with the Sierra Club mentioned, uh, the, Bob, the high cost of replacing all these cesspools. I know the area you're from has got a lot of cesspools, a lot of individual homeowners who, and businesses that have these, these cesspools. There's also the issue that you've brought up before about how uh, politicians tend to look at something like infrastructure as not being a very sexy issue, when it, in fact, if you don't solve the infrastructure problems, you're not going to solve the affordable housing problems. Yeah, well, that's a good point because sewers are a major problem for affordable housing. I mean, Mayor Wright is one of the redevelopment of Mayor Wright is one of the big housing initiatives that's been put off somewhat because there's not enough sewer capacity. The whole Kali, Palama, Ivale area is impacted because it's not just Mayor Wright. There's a major senior housing project that's being affected. There's a, a housing project related to health care that is going to be impacted. Uh, the there's a couple of major uh, 
real stops in the area, that's, and that's going to boost development also. You know, Marty Townsend, so when you talk about this issue of uh, sewer capacity, do lawmakers kind of glaze over like this, or oh, do you no, feel no, like... Oh, no, no, no. I think a lot of people are very, very concerned about this. So the cesspool report that the Department of Health released um, really brought home um, the message. 88,000 cesspools throughout the Hawaiian Islands, 53 million gallons of uh, contaminated water released into our environment every day. Uh, this is not uh, a healthy situation, and we're starting to actually see environmental impacts from that. Um, you know, in Makawao, we're having nitrates in the water. Um, Kahalu'u, where it's unsafe to swim and fish in the near shore waters. Um, and I think people are really concerned. Um, the informational briefing that they have with the Department of Health on this topic, uh, there was packed. Legislators uh, were standing around in the back and asking questions um, of the Department of Health to find out just how um, significant and widespread is this problem. And really, this is an example of where we've allowed development to happen um, and haven't planned for infrastructure. And now the only people that can really pay for it are homeowners, and that's an unfair burden. And so the Sierra Club is supporting any effort to um, help um, ease the financial burden on households um, so that they can convert to something that's more sustainable. So uh, since we're on that topic, when you start talking about infrastructure that does lead to affordable housing, when you mm -hmm. talk about the sewage capacity for the areas that Bob Ducat is talking about, Kalihi in particular, yep. and also McCulley, I think, has got, got issues. There's a lot of issues. And then these rural areas that need the cesspools converted, I mean, you say the people are interested, but are lawmakers going to be willing to throw a lot of money that way? I mean, that's the that's the major question, right? Is the political will is there? And I think it's the public that creates the political will. I mean, when we said, you know, back in the day in Waihole, when we said we don't want development here, so no sewers, and now we come fast forward to this day and we say, no, actually, we do want sewers and we want you to invest in that. Um, it's the lawmakers' job to figure out that solution, and if there really is uh, money there and we need to prioritize it. This is a public health situation. Um, we have to invest in our infrastructure. And, and you know, the, the issue of cesspools, I mean, I think this is an important distinction to make. I mean, legislators do tend to be pretty responsive when you're talking about health issues. I mean, environmental impacts that people can are experiences, experiencing right away. I mean, this could affect the water I drink. That has a lot of political power compared to maybe sea level rise or some of the sustainability climate change issues that seem so, so far off, even though they're, they're really not. Um, it's easier to kick those, you know, kick the can down the road a bit. But for health and safety issues, for pollution issues, I think that the legislators do tend to be more responsive because people get it and they're calling them and they're putting pressure on them. Um, so I think if I'm going to play the prediction game, I do think we're going to see a lot of attention pay played to this cesspools issue this session. Issue. Yeah. yeah. And I hope that legislators can take um, a lesson from the cesspool issue where we did kick it down the can exactly. for many years and we can do that with sea level rise. We're looking at $19 billion worth of property damage from three feet of sea level rise uh, by 2060. And I mean, that's you know, not that long, that's 40 years from now. Um, we need to start planning now to move back critical infrastructure, which isn't even in that $19 billion do price tag. And we need to help private property owners figure out how to move off the beaches. You know, Nicole, Wu, with Appleseed, when you talk about, when you hear this talk about, oh, maybe there's some momentum on environmental issues, is there a way for you guys to have a relationship with the environmental side of the of the of the pressure point for example to also leverage in the economic equity the equality issues no absolutely i think they go hand in hand i mean we're, it's not a surprise that we're talking about kalihi and ivile when we're talking about sewers because right. the low-income neighborhoods are the ones that tend to be ignored and don't get the infrastructure roads efforts. for why and i for example yeah and pollution tends to hit low-income communities hardest and when it comes to people who own houses near the shores, if it's their fifth house, it's, I don't feel that bad for them. But there are other <laughs> families, sorry, I don't, but other families, you know, they've been in their homes for generations and they can afford it. It's their yeah. only home. Yeah. So I think environmental justice and economic justice often just are right next to each other. Just they're different facets of the same problem a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah you know, on that, on that point, um, when you start talking too about uh, other tax policies, for example, using taxes to crack down on illegal vacation rentals. Mm -hmm. That becomes a housing issue as well, right? So mm -hmm. do lawmakers tend to get that or do they tend to say, 
wait until the, my constituents are giving me a hard time. Uh, do they get that the two things are connected? Yeah. The taxes and the housing for Airbnb certainly. It, it's such a complicated issue because we do have the tax side and the government needing and wanting more revenue. And often, if you don't like something like a soda or cigarettes, you tax the crap out of it. Am I allowed to say that on PBS? <laughs> and, we'll um, find out soon. <laughs> and but at the same time, these rentals clearly are affecting the housing market. It's affecting whether or not local families actually can find a place to live. So it's a really tough nut to crack. And I do think legislators understand the two issues are so in intertwined. Yeah. Legislators don't see enough the connection between the cost of housing and sewage treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, Kaka'ako, state put in two, three hundred million in, I think, the 80s. The housing went high end. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Colin Moore, the, the thing that strikes me about it is there's the city role and the state role. And it's always very confusing. And there's a lot of back and forth there. There's a lot of finger pointing that goes on. The city could very much hogtie the affordable housing effort if they don't deal with the sewage issue. But no one's going to give them any credit for the affordable housing if all they did was tax people more money to build more sewers, right? I mean, they're just, why would, it's that division too between city and state that's a real burden. I think it absolutely is. I mean, and, and you can see them, I mean, the heart is a perfect example of how this goes bad, right? Where they, um, people are constantly pointing the fingers at each other. Um, and one of the other priorities, I think, of this session um, is, um, this was brought up by Donovan De La Cruz, who's the chair of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, is transit-oriented development. And one of the problems with developing this, which might help alleviate some traffic problems, might help um, lower the cost of housing, is precisely this, getting the city and the state to cooperate, because they own different plots of land. There's a million different committees that don't talk to each other. The state is responsible for some parts of this. The city is responsible for some parts of this. And when it's all about credit claiming, you know, why would I help you? You work for the state. Um, then you can't really solve these, these public policy challenges. Um, and it's kind of surprising that it's hard here, even given the fact that, you know, that this is a unified government on Oahu. I mean, but still, you see these, um, you th you see these jurisdictional battles. Um, and I, I don't know how to solve that, other than that um, I think voters need to make it very clear that they're more interested in solutions than blame shifting. And that's what they've got a lot of with Hart and some of the other um, uh, TOD projects that have been Let me started. Throw out a couple of interesting questions from viewers. Um, this is less of a question, but kind of an observation. Every election seems to just be business as usual. The politicians tell their constituents what they want to hear, then they get elected as dragged issues out for as long as possible without really doing anything, and they just sit back and enjoy the power. I think this question goes to a real cynicism in the in the in in, in the voters. Um, Nicole, would you do you feel like they, there is really a sincere interest in solving these problems to the point they could overcome these kind of jurisdictional issues? Or do you think most of them are just interested in getting reelected? I'll give you that question. Good luck with that. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I hope that they ran for office because they want to solve problems, and I think most of them did. Um, you know, unfortunately, elections cost money, and they might be focused on their next election. But we also know that Hawaii has the lowest voter turnout rate in the nation, mm -hmm. and we have a one, almost a one-party system. So it's a little harder to hold people accountable. I do think voters, I know everybody's busy, they've got busy lives, but after you vote somebody in, you need to keep track of whether or not they're keeping their promises. Mm -hmm. And then if they don't, then, you know, try to find an alternative, and that's where the power lies. Well, Bob DeConte, again, as a for former legislator, you made the mention that if they get a bunch of emails, they get a bunch of phone calls, they tend to respond. But are they so comfortable, most of them, in their election districts and with their name recognition that they don't really fear being unelected? That might be true because if there is not a sustained effort, and that's something that has happened, the sustained effort on the part of voter interest groups is not there to hold them accountable. Labor, labor is not anywhere near as strong as it used to be, for example. 
Um, so there isn't the constituencies out there that can really threaten someone's seat. Yeah. And one of the things I'm afraid of is with, and I see this in the housing arena, there are so many different groups that have sprung up. There is not a real focused effort. Mm -hmm. Too many people are busy building, <laughs> sorry to say this, building their own constituency, even among the voters, mm -hmm. that focusing on issues and getting them dealt with mm. is a lot harder now than it used to be, say, a generation ago. Let me uh, throw out that, that point, though. You earlier said that you thought that perhaps homelessness, given the pressure from the media, for example, on homelessness, and Colin uh, Moore and, and also Nicole, you guys are both very interested in what happens with the homeless population. Do you think that this is the year where we're going to see some kind of real effort to deal with the homeless crisis, as I make that as a distinction between that and affordable housing, even though affordable housing certainly causes a lot of homelessness or lack of, there's also very many other issues that are very difficult to deal with when it comes to homeless. Do you, do you see the will there to deal with this? Well, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's the will to put in more money to some of the programs that are working. I mean, the one thing about the homeless Population, and I don't mean to let the legislature off the, the hook, is that it's also a very difficult public policy challenge. I mean, you're trying to serve communities that have um, your own very unique challenges. And I actually will give credit to the legislature, to the governor, and to the city for taking this problem seriously, I mean, partly because of all the pressure put on um, by the media. Um, I, I don't think there, I mean, I, so I, I do predict that there's going to be more money put into those programs this year. Um, but it's going to be a, it's a long-term problem to solve. I mean, you can't just build a lot of affordable housing units or, or places to, to house folks, um, especially in a very expensive real estate market like ours. So, um, so I think they're taking it seriously, but um, it, it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to, it's a difficult problem that'll, that'll not be solved by a single bill or a single act. I mean, it requires all of these different social services agencies being properly funded and come together, coming together. But I think they do realize that there is this public pressure now um, to take this very seriously, and I think they have for the last couple of years. Going back to something you said earlier about Scott Psyche, I was pleasantly surprised that on opening day he made such a strong statement about affordable housing, mm -hmm. homeless being the top priority, and we can't just be stewards, we got to take action. That surprised me, and if he follows through with that, uh, the public sometimes reacts in a strange way. It can be a catalytic mm -hmm. movement, you know. When I started out in these kinds of issues, Waihole Waikani, I was amazed. A bunch of us went in there with a clear, focused message. Look, your housing and your livelihood, because it was a rural community, and many of them would have been kicked out entirely. And This is by a new housing development. Yeah. Um, Nicole, uh, this kind of goes to your agenda, though, the issue of homelessness, of, of I should apply an agenda to you, but your organization's agenda. Um, what kind of things do you folks see that should be tackled that can start to um, improve the, the the livelihoods, the direct financial health of people at the poorest end of the scale? And as we said earlier, they've even developed a new acronym for the working, basically the working poor. They're not poor, but they're called this ALICE acronym. And I can't even remember all the right letters that go with that. but. Uh, what kind of things do you think would help and what things would you like to see the legislature tackle this year to bring up the life, lifestyle of the, of the lowest economic levels? Mm -hmm. Well, building affordable housing is very important and then on the other side of the equation is making sure that working families can afford rent and afford to buy a home maybe one day. So that means raising their wages and also putting more money in their pockets by uh, giving them tax breaks. So that's the sort of the stuff that Hawaii Appleseed works on. So our you know, most uh, important priorities are raising the minimum wage. Uh, we know that uh, workers just don't make enough. We just raised the minimum wage to 10, 10 an hour on January 1st. But that's, yes, that, but that's $21,000 a year for a full-time worker not taking any weekdays off. 
and I think everybody knows $21,000 a year is not what you can live on here in Hawaii. So there, there will be bills, I'm sure several bills, to push the minimum wage up to about $15 an hour. So far we have three states uh, that have passed that, plus like dozens of cities and counties. And since our families and workers here are facing the highest cost of living, they definitely deserve the highest minimum wage. What about also benefits for the people who are working when we talk about this group of people that are working? I mean, um, I was kind of surprised to know that, you know, sick leave isn't, hasn't been guaranteed and that, you know, some of the leaves that, you know, are more, that I'm accustomed to in, in the professional world that I sort of took for granted that maybe there was a law that said that had to be, Mm -hmm. that they don't exist. What, what kind of things there are you looking at? There's a lot of interest in family leave insurance, which other people know as paid family leave. The United States is the only developed country that doesn't have mandated paid family leave. I have, I have a lot of family in Canada, and my cousins get a year off after they have a baby, um, and they get wow. paid for it. And in Europe, it's similar. I think in Germany, it's like two years. Mm -hmm. so, and the employers are paying for this? Um, it's. I'm not sure how every system works, you know, their systems are different, but there are five states plus D.C. that have passed family leave insurance laws. It's running in most of those states already. And in those states, it's run sort of like unemployment insurance. A tiny little bit of money is taken out of your paycheck, and then the workers are able to use it when they have a new baby, adopt a new baby, or they have to care for a family member who's ill or uh, care for themselves if they have a serious illness. You know, last year you, you, you actually pushed for and got through um, some tax reform for the lowest incomes. Mm -hmm. Do you still see some more of that necessary? Do you see that that's a way to bring people's cost, uh, ability to live here? Come? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the earned, in in earned Income Tax Credit, which we passed last session, is a great start. It's a tax credit for working poor families, basically. Family leave insurance is actually also a low-income workers issue because, as you said, if you're in the private sector and you're kind of white-collar professional, you might think everybody gets leave after they have a baby, um, but low-wage low and hourly workers generally don't. So, and you know, they're the ones who need it the most. They're the ones who really can't afford to take time off um, when they're when they need to. So let me throw in a, another. I won't call it a 900-pound gorilla. It's sort of like a 200 pound chimpanzee, but it does have a lot of effect on, on the ability to do things like this. What is going on with the unfunded liability for pensions and health care, uh, Colin? How much of a drag is that situation on the ability to really address some of these issues? Well, actually, this is one um, EGA administration success. I mean, this, um, yeah. I think Governor Abercrombie started this, but um, the, um, the, the pension system is in much better shape than it was. Um, our, um, our bond rating is much higher than it was, and I think you're going to hear Governor Ige talking and trying to take credit for a lot of this on the campaign trail. I mean, it means the state can borrow money at, um, um, with, at a lower interest rate, um, and um, we should be funding our pension system at 100 percent here um, relatively soon. Um, you know, there, there's other problems with that, particularly um, health care, the cost of health care for retired public sector workers. Um, and this always is, a, is a, a really tough issue in Hawaii politics. I mean, our public sector unions are tremendously powerful. Um, they were largely responsible for Governor Aber Abercrombie's defeat. Um, Governor Ige has worked hard to cultivate their support. Um, but do you do see situations where we have some workers, and I'm a member of a public sector union myself, um, who are rel relatively well taken care of, who get very generous benefits from the state, but everyone pays for those. Um, and we're not able to direct money to other programs programs and for the poor because of a lot of the generous benefits um, that public sector workers get, like like me. And so, I mean, I think that is that is a, the third rail of Hawaii politics, but I think we will have to talk about it. Um, yeah, I guess I, I have a bit of a problem because you talked about the healthy surplus that we came into the 2016 legislature with, or 17. Mm -hmm. It dropped down pretty fast because one of them was the pension fund. He gave he paid a mm -hmm. lot of money there, yeah. Yeah, and the hurricane relief fund, he put a lot of money there. So the, the near billion dollar carryover dropped down to about half that amount. And on the affordable housing side, the amount that went into the rental housing trust fund, the uh, the dwelling unit revolving fund and uh, 
the public infrastructure housing too, right? Yeah. All, all were affected by that. So yeah, there is a relationship between having to pay, having to pay for these things. Yeah. Do you see that being divisive uh, among the communities that are advocating? I mean, in the past, um, conservationists and affordable housing advocates have worked together. The Legacy Lands Act is a classic example where we raise conveyance tax and put part of it towards the uh, rental affordable ha rental um, housing fund and towards uh, conservation lands, purchase of conservation lands. Yeah. And I'm just not as pessimistic as everybody else. I feel like, especially amongst young people, there is a lot of activism going on. And it may not follow the same model that we are used to, but I still find it very dynamic and engaging. And I hope they have the sustaining power to really you know, follow through and ensure accountability. But there's a lot of new candidates running for office, which is really exciting. Um, and you have a lot more people engaged uh, down at the square building, um, which is awesome, and I think we need to be, you know, our one of our jobs as advocates is to help, you know, encourage them and and cheerlead for them, and they're doing um, some excellent work getting people out, first-time testifiers, mm -hmm. and um, really raising the issues, and I think we have learned that we have to tell the legislators which are the signing objects to focus on, and that public engagement is what does that, and so I'm, I'm really excited, you know, people who got turned on by the Bernie Sanders campaign for uh, president and they show that it wasn't just a flash in the pan, that they are here and sustaining um, a longer political movement, and I'm, I'm excited for that. Nicole uh, Wu from Appleseed, do you find ever that when you're down there, you, you, you find yourself advocating for one group of people, uh, you know, for people who are at the lowest end of the economic scale, but then the, the conflict is they have to, the legislators have to pay for the union benefits and, and pay raises and stuff. Is that something you, you feel a conflict there, or do you somehow manage to talk your way into still getting in their ears? I haven't heard them say that directly to me. It might be in the back of their minds. You know, even though we have an almost entirely democratic legislature, they are very fiscally conservative. And some of this has to do with thinking about government spending as an investment, whether it's in sewage and infrastructure or cess, you know, the cesspool issue or our coastlines. You know, a lot of these things, if we don't invest now, it's going to cost us so much more in the future. And hopefully, you know, the fiscal conservatism, some of those uh, philosophies can loosen up a bit and understand that you know, investing now will pay off in the future. And that's the job of advocates like all of us around the table. So um, I'm gonna, this is going to be sort of a round table now for a minute because uh, I've got a number of uh, calls now and I want to respect our callers, you know, thank you. Uh, but these are issues that aren't right in your guys' sweet spots in terms of your advocacy, but I'd like to hear how you guys feel about it. Uh, what can be done to help seniors who own their own homes but are now in fixed income to freeze property taxes or keep them in their homes? So the question is, how big of an issue do you think it is about seniors trying to just hold on to what they've got longer? We, I think that there's been some talk about how people just are outliving their retirement these days. Uh, Bob, you're the closest one to a senior. <laughs> <laughs> I'm second, so it's okay. Yeah. Haven't thought that much about it, but uh, a couple of years ago when we pushed for the ADUs, alternative dwelling units, we, one of the reasons was to allow older couples to add on to their house or add a second smaller unit so somebody from the family could live there. But I think the uh, vacation rentals. <laughs> Got kind of hijacked by other things, right? Nicole, yeah. have you noticed that, that Sometimes when you have a great idea that seems like a great idea to help a certain group of people, it gets hijacked in the economy or whatever. Mm -hmm. When it comes to policy and law, the devil really is in the details. And the ADU law was a great idea, but it probably could have had a few more rules about income levels or you know how you can use your ADU. Um, I'm not sure if the legislature is interested in going back and looking at it, but. They'd have to override the counties on that too. Right, it's true. The law that we passed was here yeah. for Honolulu. 
And I think I, I'm we, actually really interested in this grand bargain I've heard some legislators talking about between you know these uh, income tax, um, general excise tax, and the transit accommodation tax and property taxes. And you know part of what the problem we have is because property taxes are so low, investors see this as a great place to stash their cash by buying property and not doing anything with it. Um, and we all want to protect um, homeowners, especially um, seniors on fixed incomes. But what if we drastically increased property taxes? to make it less um, exciting as an investment and then kicked back money to people on fixed incomes through in income tax credits and through other um, tax mechanisms um, that gave them actual cash they could use, right? That's part of the problem is that these people are cash strapped. Um, I mean, that's the kind of big thinking that um, I'm hoping legislators will take up this session and next session um, to be able to solve this big problem because this is the, all of the problems that we're confronting here today are man-made problems, right? We created these situations, poverty, homelessness, environmental degradation, and we can solve these problems. You know, we can fix the tax code. Um, we can fix our uh, political priorities in terms of infrastructure investment and solve these problems. It's totally doable. Real quickly, Colin, when you hear the term grand bargain, that usually involves multiple, that means the city and the state getting together on a tax policy. Have you ever seen that happen effectively? I think it's, it's very rare. Um, um, and I mean, here in Hawaii, touching property taxes is almost unimaginable. Um, I mean, this is a great policy idea, but to, to create the political will to do that, I mean, you would really would need a crisis, I think, yeah, to focus we, everyone's attention. We have a housing crisis. We do have a housing crisis, it's we true. We tried to uh, raise the uh, conveyance tax on the luxury condos and whatever, got nowhere. Yeah. It yeah. just it, it, it is it is uh, it, it is just that you hit a wall in the county government when it comes to property taxes, even if it's the right policy thing. A couple more things. Let me just throw out here, just for fun. Uh, is there medical aid in dying? Ah, uh, this is a uh, this is a really great question. I mean, this is a bill that had a lot of support that didn't go through last year. It's certainly coming. It's one of the carryover back things. This right? year, it's one of the carryover things. I mean, it got pretty far. Um, last year and there was a lot of passionate advocacy on both sides. Um, I don't think it's going to go through again this year though um, and I think that's because it is an election year and the, the folks who are opposed to it which are um, a lot of Catholics, evangelical Christians, um, for them this is intensely important and aside from a small number of people who are terminally ill this really isn't a major voting issue for people who might otherwise support it. I mean it is supported by a majority of of citizens, um, but the people who oppose it impose it intensely, and they will vote maybe based on that issue. So I don't think it's going to go through. Another quick one, um, unless anybody else wants to weigh in on that one. Okay, so where, where do the panel think Hawaiian issues will fall in this legislature? We just had a massive march yesterday. They weren't really asking for anything, but there is a specific list of asks, especially for Hawaiian homelands, for OHA, um, and then where does the panel think Hawaiian issues should fall at the legislature? Well, on the housing side, I'm interested because finally some interest is being directed at Hawaiian homes to allow them with like ADUs and... Uh, uh, to do rental property. To do, yeah, more rentals. Uh, I haven't heard that it's sovereignty is one article said is an issue that has been quite divisive among Hawaiians. Yeah, I did. That's another kind of a third rail. Nicole uh, Wu, though, uh, from Appleseed, when you start talking about the resources that are available for the Native Hawaiian lands in particular, do you see some movement there? Do you think that they might help out by taking a piece of this problem? Well, there's certainly a number of families on the Hawaiian homelands who we think of as income poor or you know wealth poor but land rich and that's part of why we were hoping to let them build the ADU so that they could get some income or their families they could have more family members live with them so you know that's a, that's an there's a resource there the land that they have but they're not being allowed to actually use it in ways that could help them economically let me ask you, you, you mentioned uh, the, the idea of this grand bargain on taxes, but one of the areas where there is a real opportunity to, to do some taxation is on these B&Bs and uh, vacation rentals. Do you, are you seeing any real interest in that? Do you think people will, the, the legislature will finally tackle that issue and be able to be effective with it? It's yeah. very divisive over there. 
Yeah, I also see that there is um, some consensus around collecting taxes there. I think that's also part of that grand bargain. We need to look at new tax income. Um, real estate investment trusts, we need to tax those. Um, Airbnbs, we need to tax those. We are, the state is leaving money on the table, and as a result, our people are going without. Um, you know, I think Hawaiian sovereignty is a huge issue. We have allowed to fester for way too long. It's another example of us kicking the bucket down the uh, down the road, and our failure to address that is compounding other social problems. Um, we need to do something, and funding OHA to the fullest extent possible, um, providing as much flexibility as possible for our Hawaiian homelands, um, and really doing all we can to help um, Hawaiians and everybody who's on the lower end of the income do better is what we need to do. And you know, one of the issues that you have uh, it, on your list is the climate change issue, which we haven't talked about very much today. Um, are we going to need to increase taxes to be able to even afford the cost of dealing with climate change? Most likely. I mean, we're talking about major um, investment in managed retreat, meaning asking people to move back from the shoreline. That's critical infrastructure like roads and utilities and also private property. And this has a direct effect um, on the quality of life for many Hawaiians. A lot of Hawaiian homelands are at risk of three feet of sea level rise in the next 40 years. And there's a lot of cultural practices and cultural sites that will be directly affected by sea level rise and we need to learn to adapt to that and that's talking about investment. And why is it important and this is part of your agenda the Hawaii focus on its energy in a way if you focus on cutting down the use of oil isn't that cutting off a revenue source as well in a lot of uh, not a revenue source that's worth it. Um, <laughs> fossil fuels are killing us. We need to get off of them. Um, the You've been sooner the better. I could tell. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, and making the investment in renewable energy um, is a way to create jobs that can't be exported, um, that are high, po high paying, quality jobs, um, and it also will help to prevent, um, minimize or uh, the worst parts of climate change. The reality is, is that we have failed to stop climate change at this point. We need to start adapting to get ready for um, the inevitable, which is a one to three foot sea level rise um, and warmer temperatures. Um, but we still have a chance to prevent the worst of it, and that's why we need to act now. And it definitely is a working class issue as well. When HECO is charging people $200 a month for, for their electricity and taking home 9% in profits for their shareholders, we really need to look at how um, the way in which we run our utilities is contributing not only to the crisis on climate, but also to the crisis in housing and property. Well, let me ask this question, uh, and maybe this is for Nicole uh, Wu. In the last five years, 37,000 people have left Hawaii due to the cost of living. Why is it not a priority for the legislature to focus on lowering those costs? Let me modify this question. I mean, that's, I think that's a good question. People say you're not doing anything about the cost of living, but many of the things that you've proposed, you guys are proposing, would lower the cost of living, especially housing, energy, yeah. eventually. But I mean, do you think that framing things around the cost of living is a good way of pitching some of these ideas you guys are talking about, that this cost of living might actually push legislators to act, whereas before it was just, oh, that's just raising this or raising that or building this? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's similar to what Colin was saying about how health and safety issues really get the attention of the public and constituents. and cost of living is something that everybody seems to be talking about all the time because we face it every single day. You and know, when, I, when I've asked people about that, oh, we should raise taxes to do this or raise taxes, they all say, but the cost of living is already so high. Right, right. And, and, and that's it. I mean, that's what people, when you, when you say, well, we have a program or there ought to be a law. And in Hawaii, we're really, in, there ought to be a law state. I mean, there's a regulation for everything. <laughs> right. Um, there ought to be what, a law what, state. How they interpret that is, okay, you're going to tax me more. I'm already heavily taxed. I mean, this is a high tax state. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, and they say, well, I don't really feel like I'm getting much for my money right now. And this is related to the trust in government. Our, the, People's trust in state government here is quite low. So in the federal level, it's 19% think, you know, have reasonable trust in government, only 19%. Here in Hawaii, it's 17%. It's two percentage points lower than even at the federal level. And so when you propose these programs, people don't trust that the money's going to go to what legislators or advocates say that it's going to go for. They think it's going to go to a bunch of public sector workers, um, or it's not going to be you know, paid, paying for the infrastructure that they want to see it being paid for. And that, that I think is the, we need a leader who can communicate that and build trust in government again so people will, will trust the legislature to support some of these programs that really will make their lives better. I don't think, I don't think it's about 
taxing more, it's about taxing better, taxing yeah. smarter. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of very, very wealthy people who excel at avoiding taxes. Real estate investment trusts are ex a perfect example of that, of just you know a tax haven. And it's incumbent on our lawmakers to figure out how to catch those mice better and tax them. Um, and we do that and we can kick those things, that money back to the public. Let me go back to Colin's point a little bit because we're heading into the last part of our show. And I think that the issues of trust in government and is like if you folks are advocating for something and you actually win then those legislators go back to their districts and they're not able to explain it well then the next time around they're gonna say last time I did what the environmentalist was I got clobbered so here's right to your point though why is governor Ige not more outspoken he does not articulate what is happening to the state to the point of suspicion uh, but what do you think Rob? Well, it's somewhat historical I don't know how we got the GET, but that's... The general excise tax. Yeah. It's a relatively easy way of raising money. It's already there. It, I don't know how they got it there, but it's there, and it's a very efficient taxing mechanism. So when you talk of, and there's a, you know, to me, it's not that high. But they say it's one of the most regressive tax. I hear Marty in my ear. Oh. Right? <laughs> and Nicole, too. It's very regressive on the poor. It, it's regressive on the poor, but not on the people at the higher income. So then you have to give it back at the other end. Well, this yeah, is what just... Marty was saying about taxing right. So, you know, uh, there have been uh, studies show that show that our tax burden on low-income people on the bottom 20% is the second highest in the country yeah. and it's uh, mainly yeah, because of the general yeah. excise tax. General excise tax right. so, and the general excise tax pays for education. Mm -hmm. but I mean, what's, what's everywhere your... else it's the property right, tax. Right, right, that's why the property right. tax is so and, low. And but... property taxes tend to tax higher income people more highly than low income yeah. people. So in this state because we're using the GET to pay for public school it's actually burdening low-income people more and you know on our cash receipts we see 4.5 or 4.712 percent but it's not that that's not just the entire amount because it's we tax our products on every step of the way through the process so yeah. when it gets off a ship and when it goes past a wholesaler so the estimates yeah. are that our GET is more like 11 or 12 percent and so that's well, let me let me I want I want to we only got about three or four more minutes yeah, and I want to I want to one thing I want to okay, get in here the concentration of land ownership here the plantation system is what I suspect led to the GET rather than the property tax right, right. yep yep that's right okay okay a couple thank you good point Robert thank you and then I was calling you Bob, so calling you Robert feels very awkward. <laughs> no, go ahead, because hardly anybody calls me Robert. Robert, okay, okay, <laughs> except your mom when she's mad. So, is there any move to systemically train, upgrade, and improve the state bureaucracy? We're not talking about the, the scare, who have shown example of not being a first class operation. So, this is sort of, is our government screwed up because our bureaucracy is so heavy and there's no accountability? You know, is that the problem? Why doesn't it get, let's start with that. Does, it, does this, what does this example of this false alarm do to people's impression of state government? It was already low and now it's worse. Um, and the answer to the viewer's question, I think, is, is yes, there, we do need, we do need to, to look seriously at a lot of our state bureaucracy, um, to, to think about striving for more excellence, to get rid of unnecessary procedures. I mean, I work at the University of Hawaii, and it is the most unbelievable bureaucracy that I have I've ever seen in my life. Um, and you know, I'm generally not so critical of those, um, those systems, but I think in here in Hawaii we have a real problem. But this does go back to the power of public sector unions. Um, and I'm, I'm pro-union, but I do think that we need to find a creative way to get together to try to create more excellence in, in state government. I should point out really quickly, though, the people that were involved in this mistake were non union That's right. That's right. Um, but what do you folks think is the impact of this false alarm on people's trust and the ability of government to even function and do well in a legislative context? We've only got a couple minutes here. I just need quick thoughts. It's going to be negative. It reinforces stereotypes of our government being 
very incompetent. So I think that forces are, I'm actually hoping it'll force some change in our state government. Um, it's, it has people talking about it and it's become an issue. So maybe, maybe the legislature will take it on as, as an impetus to sort of fix some of these problems that we all know are there. Marty Townsend, do you think this is going to help or hurt the legislative process? Yeah, I think process? We sh there's still opportunity for the EGA administration to um, flip this into a win, be able to show the leadership that people are looking for. And I also, as the militantly optimistic person that I am, I uh, am looking forward to people coming out in, in opposition to nuclear war after they get over being scared and angry. Militant op optimism, I like that. Okay, we're, we're <laughs> done for the hour. Thank you so much. And mahalo to all of our viewers for joining us tonight. And we thank our guests, Colin Moore, Associate Professor of Political Science at UH Manoa, Marty Townsend, Chapter Director of the Sierra Club of Hawaii, Nicole Wu, Senior Policy Analyst at Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice, and Robert Nakata with Faith Action for Community Equity. Next week on Insights, we are bringing back one of your favorite topics, one of the most popular Insights programs from last year. How cyber secure are you? Are we, I, I worry about that all the time. I'm getting all kind of <laughs> stuff in the emails. And, uh, new information from the same panel of experts we'll have next week on staying ahead of the cyber criminals who have come up with all kinds of new scams and threats. That's next week. Several experts on cybersecurity. Get your questions in early. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.